The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, and welcome to the ELECT webinar on Data Visualization, Part 1, Developing Skills. This is the first webinar in our two-part series on data visualization. I'm Erin Elzey, a member of the ELECT Continuing Education Committee, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. Our presenter today is Reed Jones. Reed works for the University at Buffalo in the University Libraries Annex. He has both an interest in and experience with database architecture, reporting, analytics, and data visualization with a focus on fulfillment, delivery, and access to statistics. He holds an MA in History and an MS in Information and Library Science from University at Buffalo. Reed brings much expertise to today's topic and we are fortunate to have him with us today. A few logistics for today's presentation. All attendees are muted to prevent background noise and we do not have interactive chat capabilities. You may, however, comment on today's presentation using Twitter. The hashtag is A-L-C-T-S-C-E. We do not monitor the Twitter feed, so if you have questions for Reed, please type them into the question box on your screen. We will have time for Q&A after the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and you will receive an email with links to the recording and presentation slides shortly after the presentation concludes. And now we'll turn it over to Reed. There will be a slight delay as we change presenters. All right, hello everyone. Um, thank you all for attending this webinar. Uh, my name is Reed. Um, and like it's already been introduced, I do work for the University of Buffalo Libraries. Um, so one of the things uh, I wanted to do um, was create a webinar about data visualization with a focus on data you might see in a library. Um, so the presentation and um, the accompanying data um, that you will be using um, to practice with after has a focus in that. So, I, like I said, I created this sample data um, and it'll be available after and we'll be using this a little bit in the webinar to do some examples. And um, I chose to use Excel data. Um, I chose this because it's a uh, usable tool. A lot of people have it. And it's um, alternatives, Google Sheets and LibreOffice's Calc are not quite as um, in-depth but it should give us a good uh, visualization of what we're trying to do. So let me do a little bit of an overview of what we're gonna try and go through. Um, so the way I came about building this was, uh, I came into data visualization and data analytics, um, a complete novice. I was working on a history masters when I started working in the libraries. So at the very best, um, I could identify that data was in a journal article or in a book. I knew to look for the two stars to see if things were significant, but I really didn't manipulate it. So I kind of went through and thought in the back of my head, what were the things that I really would have liked to know off the bat? Um, and so this uh, expands beyond the actual creating of the graph into a little bit of the uh, collection of data and the ways we store and connect data to other things other pieces of data. Um, so I take a kind of chronological approach, at least in this webinar. So it'll start from a relative beginning point of kind of talking about the steps needed to start manipulating data. Um, we'll talk about tools that you use and why you would use certain types of visualizations um, to create the data. And then we'll talk more about how you have to interact with all three of the stages of um, creating data, um, using the uh, data repository correctly, and also creating visualizations and um, creating reports and things like that. I do want to uh, help or give everyone a little bit of a um, help that don't worry about knowing SQL. Um, I think it's a very powerful tool and the way that I think about data is always in a database structure. Um, but to 
with most of the tools that you'll see right now, you can get through um, building a lot of things without actually having to use SQL. So um, you don't need SQL for this, but it's a good thing to learn if you are interested. So my first thing is, what is data visualization? Um, what does that really mean to us? I mean, it's a way of arranging data that makes it easy to understand its significance. Um, it means that we're actively interacting with our visual products to make sure that they're guided towards our audience. We want these to be an easier way to represent the stuff that we're collecting. Uh, we wanna make selection decisions to ensure the correct information is relayed. So that means we don't want it to be too busy. We want this visualization to be what that is, is just a good way of representing what we want to get across. So we're creating these visual indicators and they target specific findings. So what I have down here is the effective and efficient. So that's kind of what this all boils down to is a balance between effectiveness and efficiency. So effectiveness is the ability for the visualization to um, represent what you want it to represent to um, those who are going to be looking at it. Um, you want to pair that with the efficiency with which it takes to either interact with the visualization from the user side, um, because as you go in more and more into data visualization, you can make more and more user prompts and user tools that they can interact with the data, or you want to make sure that the efficiency of the time that you're taking to create this visualization is used correctly because sometimes you can get a point across better by making two or three simple graphs instead of making one very detailed dynamic graph. In visualization, we want to think on a graphic level. Um, I think in two dimensions on the X and Y plane. Um, that makes it very easy for me to understand how these are being built. And it kind of ties in all this um, Basically, this uh, knowledge that I had as a middle schooler and high schooler when I was first learning about graphs, and it kind of taps into that and brings some things in that help me kind of understand where I'm going. All right. So now, one of the first steps you really want to do before you touch any type of visualization tool is you want to get to know your data. So the first thing I can I just highly um, recommend is to plan ahead. This doesn't mean that you should always know exactly what you're going to do before you even uh, get close to trying to create a visualization or organize fields to get the things that you want, but you want to have an idea of what your goals are with the data that you have. So I think uh, it's it's a weird thing to uh, grasp because when you're um, doing visuals and things, a lot of the time is spent playing around and trial and error and finding things that don't work um, and trying to change that. But if you have a plan ahead of time, that really helps. Um, and this uh, and one of the things that you can think of is visualizations are a different way of running reports. So. If you have to run reports and um, get specific um, information across, data visualization works in a similar way. Um, so one of the things I would like I would highlight when you're looking at your data, you want to figure out what your unique identifiers and your keys are. So if you know databases um, and know what primary or uh, secondary keys are. Our primary and foreign keys are, you want to be able to find areas that you can take data and connect it to other pieces of data using a similar field that has similar information. Um, you want to be able to look at what the necessary fields are that you're going to be trying to use. This, um, when you're using uh, Excel workbook or maybe a small database, isn't as important because the fields aren't too bad, but when you start getting into enterprise data, um, like when I'm using Iliad data, not knowing what uh, database objects or what fields I really need to get the information that I want 
causes a lot of problems for me because there's just an almost it feels almost infinite supply of fields that I can pull from. All right, so that kind of goes back into simplifying your data structures. So once you find out what necessary fields you have, you also want to make sure that your data is structured in a correct way to where it will play well with the tools that you're using. So what I mean by this is saying for everything that you want to report on, you want to make it a table with no blank spaces. You want to try and um, make sure that the fields have labels and that everything underneath that is structured in a way that the one field that you have, so the one column is dedicated to a certain part of the record. So you'll have an address column or a name column. Um, and to doing this just makes it play well with the data. Um, you want to also check for validation issues you might have. Um, so this, if you're getting data that's inputted that um, has characters in it when it should be a number, you should um, be checking to see if that kind of stuff is uh, popping up and causing issues. Um, if you have something where you have uh, one field that should be the same as another, but there's an extra space in it, so it's not being counted as the same type of um, field or uh, data. You want to find those uh, issues. And this kind of comes into the next point. You want to test, test, and retest your data. So this gets into the idea that this is a constant process where you're going back and forth. You want to um, make sure that you are uh, just looking for all these possible options and always just making sure that the data comes across correctly. And this kind of comes into the next thing is you want to get another set of eyes. Um, you want to make sure that you're not working in a silo and you're not just trying to figure out everything yourself. Um, if you're creating visuals, just talk to people who either help collect the data or will view the data to get new ideas. Um, it also helps you get a breather um, and kind of take a step back when you're doing this work to get new ideas and um, figure out new ways of approaching problems. Um, keeping an open dialogue, it helps prevent some of the mistakes and miscommunications you can have when you create a visual, because if you create something that's great to you, but it doesn't work for your audience, it's still not a good visual and it didn't serve its purpose. Um, so going in from that, uh, after we kind of get to know what our data is, we can start working on data cleanup. Um, like I've mentioned earlier, you want to work on this as a constant process all the way through. So if you find errors, you can always go back and try and fix that and make it better. Um, so when you bounce between the data reports and visualizations, um, there's no real set linear trajectory. Um, so you, when you look at the raw data and the visualization structures, they help you uh, better understand what you are trying to extract. So in the data cleanup process, you will also be kind of getting a better grasp of what your data is doing. Um, and then you can start to anticipate where errors may occur. So when, you, when you're looking at your data and you're trying to figure out um, if things are correct or not before you've bounced it, uh, ideas off to other people, you could try and get in the mindset. If you know, you want to know how your data is getting pulled. Like what, is, what are the inputs? Um, is the system doing some things? Are individuals that work um, under whatever enterprise you are working for doing it? Or is it um, unregulated? Is it someone that is a patron um, putting in data. Um, so you can get into the mindset of, okay, where would these errors occur and what do I think I would make the mistake of if I was in that situation? Um, also, if you're lucky enough to be able to or, um, kind of change, uh, mess with the layouts of your databases or your servers, you can create validation rules for your um, data so that it can reduce some of these. If you can create controlled vocabularies where you only give uh, people who are entering data a certain selection of things they can off, um, 
input, it helps kind of get rid of some of the issues that you might have with things being typed incorrectly or typos or things like that. And in you can also make sure that the dates are formatted the same way every time so that you can actually run calculations based off of them. You can make sure that num new things with numerical values should have the same, should have numbers in them. Um, and then you want to, uh, if you can, develop a data entry workflow. And this is all kind of ideal if you're able to build this from the ground up. You want to be able to talk with uh, everyone that you're going to be, that you can regulate that is going to be helping in data entry or data manipulation and have a discussion about what are the best um, practices that we can do and how can we account for and help make it so that we always get the data entered correctly. And this also kind of helps build um, communication because it gives everyone a chance to be at the table and talk and contribute to this. So everyone's actively working in this workflow. A workflow also really helps you kind of dissect where problems may go wrong, because if you have a set workflow and everybody knows it, you can run through the steps. That are, so did you do this part? Did you do this part? Where do you think it might have gone wrong in this part? And then you can start kind of funneling in to figure out where these problems happen. But it really comes down to basically Communication is one of the biggest keys you can, uh, or biggest tools you can use at this point. So now that we've kind of gone through the forward part of what to do with data, I wanted to move into some of the visualization stuff in the next step. So this is the first step where we're dealing with our data and getting to know it and we feel comfortable. And now we want to do stuff with it. So this is the exciting part. Um, I want to run through uh, five different types of visualizations that I think are very useful and probably will accomplish 90% of the data um, goals that you have. Um, and the first one I have is a bar graph. So a bar graph, I think um, we've all seen one of these before. And the thing I really like about them is that they're crisp and clean if used correctly. I like that they have a good separation between each bar, depending on how you format them, but usually you can get a nice separation and it's great for comparing groups. So if we look at this visualization I have right here, um, you can see that you're looking at different employees and their average scan times. And it's very easy to tell where each employee is. And you can also use that legend and the different colorations to see what the scan times types are for different types of scanners. So this is really good at comparing different groups using a, a, the same measure. So the next visualization I wanted to talk about is a line graph. Um, these are, the bar graph and line graph, I think, are the two most popular visualizations you'll see. Um, line graphs, as opposed to bar graphs, are really good at charting change over time. The connections make it flow and it gives us this sense of that you can uh, see what's going on over a period of time and you can figure out trends. And it's really good for using date specific data. The next one is a uh, pie chart. Um, so this is used to represent uh, how a uh, how parts of a whole are comprised. So what is the proportion of each individual part in this whole um, entity? So on this graph, I did breakdowns by scans of employees. So right here, you can see that one employee has done the majority of the work here. And it's very easy to tell how the um, how the scans are being uh, distributed by um, the employee work. Um, another thing I like about scan charts is they remind me of pizza, so it gets you a little bit more um, excited when you see them, I guess. Um, and if you can somehow subtly hint that there's pizza involved, it might get your viewers more excited. Uh, one of the visualizations I like using uh, when I'm trying to figure out trends are uh, scatter plots. Scatter plots are great because they take 
two um, fields and show the relationship to them as long as they're numerical fields. What it does is it creates these um, coordinate dots that depending on how much data you have, you can get a very good idea of how these um, two different fields correlate to each other. How, first of all, how strong and in what manner do they correlate? So for my example, I did a combination of the number of scans and the duration of minutes. So you would expect that the more scans you do when you're digitizing, you would have a longer period to complete it. But you do see some things that are interesting out here in outliers. And I think this is a good way of representing where, where outliers may be. And you can drill down and figure out why those outliers exist. The final type of visualization um, I'm bringing up, and this is one that I particularly don't really use very often, but I think is a very interesting um, type of visual is a spider chart or radar chart. And as you can see, it kind of looks like a spider web. And they're really good for comparing three or more fields. Um, I've seen most of these used mostly in athletics and data like that, where you're charting um, how an individual athlete is strong in one area or maybe weak in another area. But it's another good way to relay maybe survey, survey data. Um, my recommendation when you're using this is to keep the um, measure scale the same. So say you do a scale out of one to 10 so that across all the fields, they all have the same value. You can also account for this by doing it as a percentage um, number, but that creates more calculations. So if you've got the ability to develop a survey and you're doing it that way, it's um, better to plan ahead, um, but you can manipulate after. So now that we've gone through the different types of visualizations that uh, you would commonly see, uh, I wanted to talk more about uh, the actual process of creating visualizations. So I wanted to start off by focusing on the X and Y axes. Um, so basically, uh, the five visuals I chose to highlight are all two-dimensional. And you, only, you really only need two-dimensional representations for most things. I was trying to um, find examples of good 3D um, visualizations that are used because they need to be three-dimensional. And the ones that I could come across were topographical um, visualizations, or if you're using linear algebra, you may want to use an X, Y, and Z plane. But I have never had to use a three-dimensional graph to create a visualization. And for most library data that I can envision, I don't think um, that their dimension is typically necessary. So for the purposes of this, I stayed with two-dimensional. Um, a general rule that you want to kind of think of is that you need at least one dimension or thing to compare and one thing to measure that um, compared dimension against to give you differentiation. And the most frequent use of data visualization is to have a dimension on the x-axis and a measure on the y-axis. This is, this is not to say that that is a hard and fast rule that you have to uh, do, uh, have to, um, sorry, I'm reading the chat. Yeah, this is not a hard and fast rule. So you can sometimes uh, switch the axes depending on what you need to do um, and how the visualization comes across. Um, a good example of what you might, when you might want to switch the uh, X and Y axis is if you're doing a bar chart, but you're doing a top 10 um, instances of something happening and you want to flip the, it so that the y-axis has the uh, name of, let's say, it's an employee and the amount of um, objects they've uh, checked in um, and you want to do a top 10 of that, you can switch the axes because it shows more naturally kind of a hierarchy, a top to bottom list. Um, so when I think about uh, two dimensions, the X and Y plane, uh, that works for bar graphs, line graphs, and scatter plots, but it doesn't um, really adhere or help you with understanding pie charts and 
um, radar charts because they don't adhere to the X and Y plane. Um, but it still helps you kind of understand where you want to use measures and where you want to use dimensions if you think of kind of the X axis, axis always having more qualitative information and the Y axis hope, um, having um, more of a measure of quantitative information for you to look at. So what I want to do now is kind of break down what I mean by measures and dimensions. Um, so far, I've tried to limit my terms, but there are a lot of terms that you can use to talk about data. And I've um, talked about fields, elements, numbers, measures, and dimensions. To simplify it, I kind of want to you know, focus on the idea of dimensions and measures. So both measures and dimensions are taken from the fields in your data. So a field is, when you look at a table, the column heading is the field that you're looking at. A dimension is when you take that field and break it down into what it contains. The dimensions are the things that it contains. So for employee, na like first name, the name Kevin would be a dimension that you're looking at. Um, so that would be like the product of that dimension. Um, usually it's qualitative. Um, and that makes it easier to uh, kind of understand. So a name or an address would be a good dimension. But you can have numerical um, dimensions. And the same goes for measures. Measures are calculations based on your data. So it's always numerical, but you can use a qualitative field and create a measure based off of it. So let me give uh, a couple of examples. Um, so if you want to do um, how many uh, vacations days do each employee have, you can say um, your dimension is going to be the employee name or employee ID, and the measure is going to be vacation days. Um, and that means a dimension is qualitative. It's giving you the name, and a measure is numerical. So it's giving you a value that you can compare against. But the opposite can be true. So what if I wanted to figure out salary like salary ranges of my employees? Um, what I would have to do now is take the salary dimension, um, and that's a numerical value, and turn it into qualitative dimensions that I can compare against. So a range from let's say thirty to fifty thousand, and then fifty uh, fifty. A one to seventy thousand, and so on and so on, and then I would want to compare it against the uh, number of employees in that range. So the employee name itself is a qualitative um, field, but we can turn it into a calculation based on how we interact um, with that field and turn it into a measure. So below I have four different um, types of ways to turn dimensions into measures. Um, and I'm going to go out of order to focus on count and count distinct first because they apply to this example specifically. So count, what count will do, we'll look for the total instances of data in that row and give you a count based on that um, selection that you have in the dimension. So for salary range, if I do a count of employee names in a salary range from um, 30 to 50,000, let's say, it'll look for all the um, employees that have a, that um, salary range. And then it'll give me a count of that. Count distinct is slightly different. Count distinct looks for the count of unique um, data entry points in a field. So this works really well for me in my Iliad data because we have transaction numbers that we use as a unique or as a counting measure. But with the structure of the data that we have, anytime a note or a comment is put on a transaction number, it duplicates that transaction number in the table. So I have to consolidate those all together. So even if I have 
300 different um, transaction number 12s, I can use count distinct and have that only pop up as one counted one time. In addition, uh, you can do a sum of the values that you would uh, want to use. In so, if you're looking at uh, perhaps uh, you're looking at salary again, and you want to do a sum of the actual salary, um, the actual amount you're spending in that salary range based on the amount of people, you can do that, or you can do an average. Um, so another example of a good way to do average is say you have your scan um, scans and you have however many minutes you wanna do, you can do an average of scans per minute. So you get a scans per minute field and then you've got the, that time and then you wanna figure out across the employees that like for each scan they do, um, they'll have a scan per minute number, but you wanna get the average across all the scans that that employee has done, you can turn it into an average. Okay. As we move on from uh, measures and dimensions, I wanted to talk a little bit about calculated fields. Um, this is a good way uh, to make your data easier to use. Um, this is something where you can go back into the data and create new fields that make it easier to manipulate. Luckily, now there's a lot of tools that have great functionality in the visualization phase where you can do calculations, but using calculated fields has distinct advantages if you know how to do it. Um, so this would be usually either in Access or Excel would be good examples of where you would be doing this kind of stuff if you can get back to the data. Um, if you're doing server-side stuff, you can do calculated fields using SQL, but it takes some effort. Um, but for the purposes of what we've been doing, I'm thinking in the mindset of Excel. Um, so what it does is it allows you to reuse this element instead of creating a visualization where you have a calculation just on one visualization you'd have to remake that on the next visualization if you want to use it again. If you have a calculated field, you can then go about um, basically reusing it across a bunch of different um, visualizations that you wanted. It's always going to be there. Um, also, you'll notice this when you deal with more and more data. The more calculations you put into the visualization, the longer it'll take to process. So if you can remove some of those calculations and put them in before when the uh, inside the actual data itself, it makes it much easier. Um, some really good uh, examples of how to use this correctly is uh, when you're doing time difference. Um, sometimes if you use date stamps, it's very difficult to get a time difference um, when you're doing a data visualization at that point because it's um, a complex calculation to take that date stamp, turn it into whatever unit of time measurement you want, and then get the difference itself, um, and then have it calculate and bring it back out accurately. I've had many troubles with that. So doing that ahead of time um, is usually really helpful. Another thing that you can do ahead of time is set the fiscal year, um, start and end uh, months, which allows you to get fiscal year data. Um, and then a specific example to the data sheet that you'll be uh, looking at later is something that uh, I alluded to earlier, but um, in the data sheet, we have the scans and the amount of time it takes to scan on this digitization project. But I created a calculated field of scans per minute. And the reason I did this is because if I wanted to get the scans per minute, I could do that easily in a visualization. But if I want to break it down by employee, I'd have to get the average or the difference of the scans per minute. And then I'd also have to get the average of the total scans per minute. So the creating that formula would be much more difficult than creating a scans per minute field and then going in and just getting the average of that field that's already created. So this might be the most important 
thing to remember about data visualization is filters. Um, so this is how we go from very general data to very specific and granular and interesting things. Um, it's a really good way of digging in um, and they can tease out really interesting results. Uh, filtering in most tools defaults to let the user select from a list of all the distinct pieces in the data in that field. Um, if the list is a uh, short, it's great, but you're, when you're dealing with hundreds or thousands or even millions of options, it can be anywhere from inefficient to impossible to filter based on just selecting data points um, that you want to keep. So you can filter using that if it's possible, but there's a couple of uh, different types of filters that I use that help me kind of filter out what I'm looking for on larger data sets. Uh, contains is probably what I use the most. Um, and this is looking for uh, instances of whatever you type into that filter. So say I am looking for uh, in a, within a field, all the um, pieces of data that have ALL all in it. Contains will look for any instances of that within these records. So it'll bring back anything that says all, but it'll also bring in things that say recall or falling or allocate. So it, no matter where that ALL is in the data, um, it will grab it as long as that ALL is in order. And depending on what uh, software you use, my general rule of thumb is contains is not case sensitive, but sometimes it can be. Um, with Excel, I believe it's not um, based on when I was testing it earlier. Um, equals is a really cool tool because it's both a numeric one or uh, a, uh, um, sorry, I am for, the word is escaping me, qualitative, uh, numeric or qualitative uh, filter. And what it can do is basically it says, look for a, a field in the data and any time that this comes up exactly, show it to me. So this is a really good way to filter if you know exactly what you want, if you have an exact quote that you're looking for, say you're looking for that piece of information that you couldn't find and you know that there's one part of the field that you remember, this is a good way to do that and get very, very specific results. Um, greater than or less than um, things or greater than or equal to or less than or equal to are really good for filtering out um, information. I use this a lot when I'm trying to figure out uh, CERC history or uh, the like usage of certain types of materials. So I want to see like the top, or I want to see only things that have in the last month that have uh, circulated more than once, or things like that. So it's really good for giving you filters on numeric data. And then I wanted to talk about begins with as compared to contains, because it's another way to uh, filter qualitative data or um, uh, alphabetical stuff. Uh, begins with looks at the beginning of what's typed into your data um, along a field in one cell and looks at the top of front of it. So if we use that same example of ALL all, then we'll um, get results that say either all or allocate, but you won't get results like falling or recall because those are, um, the ALL does not come at the beginning of the text. Um, so in the opposite light, if you go from filters to groups, groups are a way of taking really granular and specific data and trying to get back to the bigger ideas. Um, so if you're overwhelmed by a lot of different um, dimensions or uh, stuff like that, you can create groups that kind of give you a better explanation of where they sit. Um, the way I used it um, is if you have academic departments, you can group them all into the colleges that they reside under. So it gives you an easier visualization than seeing hundreds of different departments in the university. Um, and it's, uh, it's a pretty good tool for when you're using large scale data and you wanna try and figure out uh, who's, who's using what uh, in a larger sense. 
Um, sets are very similar to filters, except for they're reusable. Um, and this is more of a concept than it is like a specific tool. Um, I want to give a disclaimer that sets is very easily used in Tableau and it's built around um, using one field to filter on, but it's a reusable filter. But you can do the same thing across the other, other um, tools that you have, as long as you understand the uh, concept of it. But it's saying that I want to create a certain set of filters and create a data set that I can reuse for a bunch of different visualizations that is different from the data set that I typically use. Um, so it's, it's really good for reusing and it's going back into that data and thinking ahead to try and figure out what your visualizations are going to be and how you want to um, interact with them. So after we've gone through kind of how to use all these tools to kind of get deeper into our visualizations and get things better. And we've got a visualization popped up. We've decided that this is the right type of graph we want. We're gonna now go in and use things, what I call differentiation. So you have colors, sizes, and shapes are the main ones. Um, a lot of people, or a lot of the bad examples of uh, visualizations uh, that I've seen take these concepts and use them more aesthetically than with purpose. The reason you want to use colors, sizes, or shapes is to show the user a specific difference between the two things or two or three things that you're comparing. Um, so you don't want uh, it to basically just be a rainbow of colors that doesn't really have any significance. Uh, it's, it could be, when it's used correctly, it's a complement to filtering. It basically gives you another tool to channel people's um, view into certain things and understandings of how things are related. So you want to think about how the user would interact with your graph and how color, size, or shape would help with that. So I have uh, an example that I'd give you. It's basically, if you create a bar graph and you show the average time of different types of scanners used, you would keep the bar colors the same because that measure is always the same, the amount of time that it's being used. But if you then wanted to make the graph more complex and see a difference between full and part-time employees, then you could have the graph have two bars under each type of scanner for full-time and part-time, and the color differentiation would show the difference between full and part-time staff. Therefore, you're using color instead of having to have a whole another graph or a whole another label set to get the point across very quickly. And this kind of goes into my last uh, point about labels and keys. So labels and keys are great because they'll give you information that you need to relay to the user, but you want to use them concisely and as little as you possibly can. Um, so you want the title to be short and concise as best you can. You want your axes labeled logically, um, usually using field um, labels is pretty good. And if they're um, shortened, you can expand them out a little bit. But you also want to make sure you use the unit labels if you have to. Um, I can remember my middle and high school teachers, uh, they would roll their eyes every time I submitted a graph without the correct units. Um, and my math teachers. Um, but what you can do with that, is, what you want to do with that is basically just make it so that it's very, on a first glance, you can see what's being compared, what it's being compared against, and what is the point of the graph. Um, and the last thing I want to talk about is uh, slices and pages are an uh, interesting way to get the user to interact with data. Um, and it's a way of letting the user kind of filter out stuff. So I, instead of going really in depth in that, I kind of want to show you a, a quick example of kind of what I was talking about. So I'm just going to hop over into the uh, data set that you'll be given after this webinar and show you a couple of examples. So we're going to look at this question of what is the scan rate of each employee and is it impacted by the type of scanner used? 
So if you look with me right here, we've got a data set. And what I've done is I've created a table where everything is kind of very straightforward and very simplified. So I have my fields and I have my data and it's all formatted. So what I want to do is I want to create a new worksheet and I will go into insert. And I recommend using pivot chart. Um, this will work for all the graphs we talked about, except for scatter plots. Um, scatter plots are um, slightly different and you have to do it with a recommended chart. Um, but for everything else, you will use the, use the uh, pivot chart because it allows you to actually interact with your data as you're doing it, as opposed to uh, interactive chart, which just gives you the visual. So now I've selected the table that I want to grab everything from, and now I'm going back into my pivot chart. So what I want to do, sorry, I have to move this over so I can see what I'm looking at. So you have on this right hand side in the pivot chart, you'll have filters, a legend, axis, and values. So our question was, what is the scanner of each employee? So first thing I want to ask myself is what type of visualization do I want to use? Um, based on what we've talked about, my selection would be a bar chart because it's comparing employees and the measure is the scan rate. So I'm going to try and make a bar chart. So what do I need? I need on my axis, I need my employees. All right. And then I just drag that into the axis. And then I want to figure out the scan rate. So because I've already made that scan per minute calculated field, I can just use that as values. But as you can tell, 37 scans per minute seems a bit excessive if I go back to the data. So this is where a problem might be. Because our uh, scans per minute has been about at the highest 2 to 2.2. .2, so that can't be right. And that means I need to go back in and change this. It's not, it shouldn't be some. It should be the average. And this will show me a little bit better. So now I've got at least a visual starting to take shape. Um, what I want to do after that, and this is something I've uh, always focus on is you want to have data labels and it, for some reason it always defaults to having uh, a ton of decimal points but I can change that by formatting the data labels and then going down to this number so I'm in the label options under number so I go down and I want to make it a number a decimal place is two so that makes it much more usable. So we've completed the first step of at least getting a visual across that shows the different scan rates for employees. But now we want to figure out what's going on um, by scanner, because there's two different scanner types in this data. So I'm going to go back in and scanner. So instead of dropping this into Axis, I'm going to drop it into Legend and watch what it does. So this is a nice thing about this uh, software is it can do the color differences for you. So now you can tell based on the color which scanner was used and what the difference even between it or within the same employee is on their scan rate. Unfortunately, it would do have to go back and format the uh, numbers again. So that would just be back under label options number. And then we'll go back to number and make the decimal points too. And then you've got that. So for the benefit of time, I'm going to end there. But what I would do next is go into the label or the axes labels and the title and make sure that this is nice and uh, clean. But I want to make sure there's time for questions. So I'm going to uh, skip to that. But right before I do, I want to say um, if you get stuck, make sure to ask anyone um, that you think might know. Um, even a new set of eyes from someone who doesn't work with data, they might come up with something that you didn't think about. Um, YouTube and Google are great resources for finding specific questions. 
Um, and don't be afraid to post questions on a forum. You'll get a really cool answers and everybody's typically very helpful. Finally, just take a break from uh, what you're looking at and just give yourself a chance to kind of distance yourself from the problem and come at it with a new sense of energy. Um, I do have links to helpful resources. Um, W3 Schools for SQL is one of the best things I've done. Um, this uh, place called Kaggle is a really great place for dealing with data sets. It just gives you uh, data sets to play with if you want to work on this, but you don't know what data to use or you don't have a good data set. This is a good way to just practice. Um, the Tableau community is great, and Mr. Excel is a really cool resource for um, lo just learning about Excel and getting into the very um, like high-level Excel work. But it goes all the way from very basic to extremely high-level. So I will hand it over to Aaron so we can start doing questions. All right, yeah, thank you, Reed. This has been a really great session. Um, as Reed said, we now have time for questions. So in addition to all the great tools he suggested for asking questions and finding answers, you have some time now. You can type them in your question box on the GoToWebinar control panel on your screen. Um, and just a reminder that you will be sent the slides at the end of this pres at the end of this webinar, as well as the recording. So you will be able to use those links that were presented on Reed's last couple of slides. Um, and he will also be sending along the Excel spreadsheet and another document to help walk you through the process of doing that on your own. Um, so we do have a couple of questions that have come in so far. The first one is, how do you normally collect your data, and when it is when it is collected, how long does it normally take you to create your Excel spreadsheet? So it depends on what I'm doing. With Iliad data, we have it backed up almost instantly, and I do a direct connection to it through Tableau. So for that tool, I can really play with this stuff almost instantly, and I don't even need Excel to do that work. Um, before I had that tool, what I would do is I would run queries in in Iliad and export them to Excel um, for things that I needed. This this obviously didn't give me very much functionality, but I could create reports pretty quickly off of that. Um, yeah, and I think uh, talking to people that run with your servers or systems or things like that is very good for big data on how to figure out the connections. Um, and if you have any more follow-up questions or anything like that uh, specifically that I can answer, I would be happy to. I'm just hoping I got some type of answer across. All right, thank you. And this next one kind of builds on what you just said about talking with your systems people. Um, we have a question on if you have suggestions for tools to monitor and facilitate communication amongst teams or classes. Um, this person says they've used Slack and Asana, but that mm -hmm. doesn't, an email, an email itself doesn't seem to be the right fit. So if you have any other suggestions. Yeah, I mean, I think we've used Slack probably to the most as the most successful tool. But my general trend is to bug people um, in like with phone calls and in person if I can. Uh, I mean, within reason, you obviously understand the workloads of everyone else. But if you're having an issue, uh, try and get the question out in person or in writing. Um, and then, I mean, depending on obviously deadlines and things like that, if you can take a break from it and wait till it comes back, it might not be a bad thing for other reasons too, just for your general health and stress. But I would say Slack is pretty helpful. We have Cisco WebEx, which is connected to everyone, so we use that. But I like Slack more because it gives you a good historical record um, for the group and you can use it as like a ticketing system almost to troubleshoot previous problems. Um, you could try doing something like a libguide or um, maybe if you have something like SharePoint uh, where you could do a repository for these kind of issues that have people into it. But I think if you're having troubles with it, it might not be the tool. It might be the um, way that it's structured internally and trying to get everyone on board with actually using these tools might be a good way to do it. Sorry for rambling, but that's a really cool question. All right, thank you. And then we have one more, and it's, do you know of a solid intro overview for Excel pivot tables, just to save our attendees the time of searching for one? Uh, not off the top of my head, but I could find one, and I could try and send that out. 
Um, okay. But I know Linda has some really good stuff uh, through the New York Public Library, um, if you're fortunate enough to be able to do that uh, and live in New York State, that's not really helpful for anybody outside of New York. Um, but I think uh, if you YouTube pivot table usage, you might find some really good explanations, probably better than the professionally done ones. Uh, okay, great. Thank you. So that covers all the questions that we've had submitted today. Um, so we will have Reed back here again with us next week for part two of this webinar. Um, so thank you all for being with us. We're glad that you could. Um, you will soon receive a short online evaluation form. Please take a few minutes to respond to those questions. Your comments are very valuable and do help the Continuing Education Committee plan future events. Um, the email, as I said earlier, will also include links to today's slides, recording, and the con assignment in Excel spreadsheet that Reed has prepared. And you also now have the opportunity to receive a certificate of attendance, so that information you'll also find in the email. And once again, a big thank you to our presenter, Reed Jones. Uh, thanks also to members of the Continuing Education Committee, Wanda Jazieri and Dana Hanford, and to Alana Warren from the ELECT office. The support they provide make it possible for us to present these webinars. ELECT has other continuing education events coming up. Next week, we do have part two of the data visualization series, as well as additional webinars throughout the remainder of 2018. Please see the ELECT website to register or find more information on these. And ELECT offers web courses, which are four to six weeks long, as well as two-day email discussions. Our next e-forum will be on November 13th, discussing e-book management, what works and what doesn't. Uh, please check the website for information on upcoming courses and discussions. And so thank you all for joining us today. This will conclude our session, and we'll see a lot of you next week.